right, for the rest of us, if we'll take our Bibles and turn to that passage that Pastor Kurt just read, Luke chapter 12. And while you're turning there, um, back from the Southern Baptist Convention this week, um, and and I just want to say that the media likes to take things and really spin them whichever way that they can to either make us look foolish, and sometimes we are, um, to make us look foolish one way or another. Um, And then there's always these extreme um, fundamentalists who who say the sky's falling. I'm here to report that we have a good and strong Southern Baptist Convention that is committed to the fidelity of the Word of God, um, like like it's rooted in our history, that baptism across our, our convention is up 20, almost 27 percent from the same from, from last year, from the last year. Um, we have more students enrolled in seminary, seminary enrollments up. And the, the highlight of the Southern Baptist Com- Convention every year is commissioning missionaries to go overseas. And we had a chance to commission 83. Um, and we have, we have, we commission other, yeah, that's, that's good. That's good. We, we commission several, in, in several different places and, and opportunities for missionaries to be commissioned and sent out other times than just at the Southern Baptist Convention. But those, those 83, it's always a special time to be able to do that for, for almost 11,000 messengers to gather and to send them out. And um, I would just say that most of those missionaries... Um, if you've never been to uh, one of those commissioning services, we, we, they are locally every now and then, and you have a missionary and, and usually a spouse that says, hey, we're, we're being sent to, and they name the country, the people they'll be working with, and we clap and we celebrate. And then there's a time where they have to stand behind a covering where their face cannot be shown and their real name cannot be shared because of the places that they're going and the vast majority of those 83 that were sent out, we never saw their face um, because they're going to some of the darkest places in this world, and that's a good thing, and we celebrate with them. I'm going to give a full full account of the um, Southern Baptist Annual Meeting at our next quarterly business meeting. And so if, that's, if you're interested in that, or you have questions and you just want to say, hey, I read this, tell me what really happened, I'd love to be able to share that with you, but we'll give the full, full report at our next quarterly business meeting. Well, t- today we're going to wrap up our series in foundations. Um, foundations, we, we've, we've taken scripture and we've said, what do we need to build our lives around and what does the church need to be built on? And so we looked at several different things and we started out by talking about the word of God, right? Because all of our beliefs, everything that we're rooted in starts with the word of God. It determines if we go right or if we go left or if we're right on track, the word of God determines that. So we had to start out with the word laying the foundation for everything else that was to come. Then we talked about the gospel, right? That it's our responsibility to share the gospel and to advance the gospel. Our lives need to be about showing the gospel, speaking the gospel. And so we talked about what that was. We talked about what the gospel wasn't. And then we followed that up by talking about discipleship. And if you think about evangelism and discipleship, they are like different wings of the same plane. That if you get too heavy in one and too light on the other, you're not going to be flying straight. And so discipleship is really important for those coming to know Christ. And we spend the rest of our lives sharing the gospel and being discipled. Then we talked about fellowship. We talked about the idea that I exist for you, you exist for me, we exist for each other in fellowship with one another. And God uses, uses us to strengthen us. And we talked about missional living. We talked about missions, that it's our job to advance the gospel, not just locally, but also to the ends of the earth. We talked about ministry, that every one of us are gifted to serve. And when the church is the strongest, is when the people of God are serving to build up the body. Then last week, Pastor Ron preached on worship. And we're going to finish today with a foundation, our final foundation being on generosity. And I mean, because who doesn't love a good sermon on giving, right? Um, we, we, just, we, love, we love a good sermon on giving. I, I would tell you that um, it's not about a pastor just wanting my money, even though that's what we've come to believe because we've watched um, televangelists on TV say things like, if you have a headache, 
put your hand on the screen and send a hundred bucks and I'll pray that God would heal um, your headache. And so we, we've sort of swung so hard that anytime giving is brought up in church, um, we shy away from that. Um, did you know that, G- that out of all of the things that Jesus said in Scripture, about 15% of what he, what he taught on dealt with your possessions or, or, your, or your money? More, more. Jesus taught more about your possessions and more about your giving um, in, in, your, in your resources and your money more than he taught on heaven and hell combined. This is a big deal. This is a big deal for Jesus. And we get to this, we get to this story, and Jesus has been teaching. He has been preaching up to this point. And in the middle, almost the middle of his sermon, someone yells out in the crowd. This is what Pastor Kurt just read. Uh, hey, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. All right? Like, I mean, talk about totally off the wall, totally out of place. Tell my, my brother's not, he's not being fair with me. Um, and so maybe, maybe the fa- maybe this is their first Father's Day without their father. Maybe he's passed away because the inheritance has been doled out. And just like in most cases in this time period, the oldest son would have got the lion's share of the, of the inheritance. And this other son says, hey, not, not that fair. I don't agree with the, what dad did. I don't agree with him leaving everything or, or, the bulk of things to my brother tell my brother to to divide the inheritance with me and jesus he he he's uh, he's, a, he's a little bit if he even if he even he could be he's a little bit shocked that this guy would even ask such a question um, and he doesn't come right out and address it almost as if to say you are concerned with lesser things then, but, but, and so Jesus looks past the 50-50, dividing this up, and he begins to go after this man's heart, um, which this man was coveting. He was desiring um, may, maybe more than he should or in a, in a manner in which he shouldn't have. And so Jesus tells this story of a, of a very successful farmer who had a bumper crop and had, had more, more of a harvest than even the ability to store it. And so as he was growing in wealth and growing in land and growing in crops, he decided, you know what, I'm going to tear my small barn down and I'm going to build a bigger barn. I'll, I'll be a bigger barn builder so that I can house all my, all my crops. And then, and then I've got so much, I don't need to really work anymore. And so I'm just going to sort of retire. I'm going to take it easy. I'm going to enjoy. Um, and I'm going to live all these years just sort of enjoying what I've built with my hands and then God calls him a fool because he says that very night, everything that, this very night, your life is going to be taken from you. Your life is going to be required from you. I am ending it for you. And then your stuff, who's going to get it? Everything you've worked for, where is it going to go? And then he ends in verse 21 by saying, so it is with those who lay up treasure for himself. And then, and then get this, and is not rich towards God. What we're talking about today is how we can be rich towards God. And it all hinges on generosity. Um, We're going to see that here in this text. And by the way, because we're not doing a Father's Day sermon, we're just right in line with our series. Fathers, teach your kids how to be generous. Grandfathers, teach your kids how to be generous and line up with, with teaching them how to be rich towards God and not towards things of the earth. Here, here's how we're rich towards God. The, the, the text gives us a few clues. Number one, if you're taking notes, we are to be generous with our resources. We're to be generous with our resources. So verse 13 says, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And I won't say that how my kids say it when they're like, dad, tell, tell my sibling to share. Um, there's a little more emotion than that. Uh, Verse 14, but he said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Now, we've we've got to work with that for just a second. Because the American dream teaches that life, life, it, life is wrapped up in the abundance of our possessions. 
Is that not what the American dream is, that you, can, that you can come to America, you can come here poor, and you can go from rags to riches if you work hard enough? It's the land of opportunity. We love a good rags to riches story, don't we? That's, that's what we love. It's part of the American dream that, 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 you, that you upgrade from a starter home to a family home to a retirement home to a house on the lake, and you upgrade to a nicer car and you upgrade to nicer clothes. It's all about the American dream and what Jesus comes in and is he flips that. He flips the American dream and says that's not, that's not the pursuit. That's not why God gives us wealth. That's not what we're to chase after. The American dream, we do see here in this text. We see it in verse 16. Look what it says. He told them a parable saying the land of a rich man produce plentifully and he thought to himself what shall I do for I have nowhere to store my crops and he said I'll do this I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones and there I will store all my grain and all my goods the American dream it's let's accumulate more let's have more let's have better 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 stuff that is the American dream. Is it, I feel like I'm speaking to calves looking at new gates, all right? But you do understand that's the American dream. That's what we're taught to chase, to chase after. And, and, and he uses this farming imagery as he often does. Um, I, I grew up in southwest Oklahoma, and what would happen, um, you would, if you had really good crops and you did really well, and you as a farmer made, made a lot of money, and that's, which is a joke, right? Because farmers, they don't, they don't really make a whole lot of money, but, but we, maybe there was a really good year and so you take your taxes to your tax preparer and they say wow you did really really good this year if you don't spend another hundred thousand dollars the government's going to get you and so you know what the person you know what the farmer does he goes out and invests in a hundred thousand dollars of brand new machinery whether he needs it or not because he wants that tax write-off and then he's got a brand new machinery so he has to have a different bar and so he goes to, to do that and it's just like this 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 tax write-off game that farmers sometimes do to get more and to more, get more and more. And I'm not going to just pick on farmers because we do that in, with our 401ks, 401ks, right? That we need more and we need to accumulate more. Um, we, we need to, to have more. We do that with rental property, right? I'm going to buy this rental property. I'm going to rent it out. Oh, it's making me some money, so I need to go get another one and, and then get another one. That's what this guy is doing, and it's the American dream. Um, why, why? why? Why do we do that? Why, why, why does this guy do it? Well, this guy, his desire was for a more cushy retirement, right? Let me just be comfortable. Let me just, I've worked really hard. Let me just enjoy the goods that I've, that I've accumulated. We're going to see that here um, in, in, in just a second. Um, but but it may, maybe it's for comfort. Maybe we accumulate all these things for comfort, for the cushy life. What's really interesting is in verse 20, God calls him a fool. He says, you are a fool. And why? It's not, I would submit to you, it's not because he's rich. He's not a fool because he's rich. He's not a fool because he has lots of money. He's not a fool because he has lots of stuff. He's a fool because he doesn't understand the reason God's given him the things that he's given, and it's not for just him to enjoy, but it's ultimately for God's glory. He has no understanding of why he's given the things that he was given. Rick Warren um, pastored a, a uh, mega church, and he's written several books and made, made lots of money doing that. And he was, uh, he was being interviewed um, by a news network, and money came up. And, you know, we're in the midst of this prosperity gospel that God exists to make you rich, to make you happy, to give you almost like you're Aladdin and, he, and he's the genie in the bottle. Um, he'll give you whatever you wish for. The, the question came up on, on money and on, in particular in wealth. And here's what Rick Warren said. Rick Warren said, it's not a sin to be wealthy. Rick Warren says it's a sin to die wealthy. Now, you're not going to read that in Luke chapter 12, verse 8 or whatever, but, but, the, but the, the idea there is that God gives us our resources not just to enjoy, even though there's other places in Scripture where it tells us that, that He's given us things, everything to enjoy. It's not just to enjoy. 
It's to be senders. It's to share our resources, to be generous with our resources. Elsewhere in Luke, a rich young ruler comes up to Jesus, and he, he begins to ask Jesus this question. He says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus tells him, he says, you know all the commandments, and he starts listing out several of the commandments. And, and the rich young ruler says, well, I've done all that. I've done that since, I was, since I've been a boy. Check, 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 check. I've done everything. And here's what Jesus said. You lack one thing. Take all your wealth, sell all your, all your possessions, sell them, sell those things, give it to the poor, and then come follow me, and you'll have riches in heaven. And what Jesus is not doing is saying that somehow you can buy your salvation. What Jesus is not saying is that it's a sin to be rich. What he is doing is he's exposing to this man the one thing in his heart that mattered to him more than God. He's saying this, 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 is, this is your hang-up. And, and the scripture says that that man walked away sad because he had great wealth that he was not willing to part with. See, what the rich young ruler didn't understand is that we were to be generous, generous with our resources. We are a, um, a church that teaches Dave Ramsey principles. Every now and then we'll do the Financial Peace um, University. Um, Dave Ramsey principles, I, I, we, we incorporate these in our, in our home. I've got, I, I, I'm even so hardcore on this, we've got the Every Dollar app and Randy's in the nursery. You can go ask. No, don't don't ask her because I drive her crazy on that. On trying to keep up, keep trying to keep up with, with with the charges, making sure we're categorizing them everywhere they go. We, listen, we're a Dave Ramsey people. There's one thing I don't necessarily agree with Dave Ramsey on. He says, emergency fund, um, pay off debt, invest in retirement, get rid of all these things, and and build some wealth so that later you can be generous and, and super super generous. I think Scripture teaches us that we are to be generous all along the way. And so for some, that might mean we need to reorder our lives now around what we do with our resources. And maybe if you can afford a $100,000 truck instead of the $100,000 truck, maybe buy the $50,000 truck and try to figure out ways to use those resources, the other $50,000, to Invent, uh, to invest into the kingdom. If you can afford a $10,000 truck, maybe you get a $5,000 truck and try to figure out how to advance, how to, how to invest the other, the other amounts to, to impact, impact the kingdom. We reorder, reorient our lives around being generous with our resources. You see, for some of us, it's not that um, it's not that we can't be generous. It's just that we have left no margin in our lives for generosity. So when we get that $10,000 raise, rather than being content with the 10000 less lifestyle, we figure out a way to spend that $10,000, and then all of a sudden it's gone, and we can't be generous towards others. Or we, we, we upgrade the house. We upgrade the car and create no margin for error so that when the AC goes out, all of a sudden we, we can't be generous anymore. Or inflation hits, we can't be generous anymore. So maybe, the, maybe the calling here in this text is not to do this and this and this. Sometimes I wish Scripture would say that. Do A, then B, then C. Maybe it's more than just a heart trying to figure out how to reorder our lives around being generous. We sent out 83 missionaries this week, and I celebrated that with, with 11,000 other messengers. Why didn't we send out 100 missionaries or 183 missionaries or 500 missionaries? It's not that God's not calling men and women to missions. It has nothing to do with their passports, nothing to do with, with their visas. We're sending less missionaries maybe than we should. Maybe it has more to do with us not using our resources to send. As I was preparing this week, um, I looked up some, um, some statistics, and, and Vanco is a, is a company that studies church statistics, and here's what they say. They say 5% of churchgoers tithe. 5% of churchgoers tithe. Um, And what I just what I what I would just say concerning that, um, I don't know. I don't know if I need to say anything concerning that. 
other than if that's what Christ calls his people to do. I know there's arguments on the New Testament, Old Testament, it's Old Testament principle. I believe it's taught in the New Testament just the same. But we argue why we should have to give less for God. Why, why we have to, we, our argument is, hey, we don't really have to tithe. God just loves a cheerful giver. We just decide in our hearts what to give. He loves a cheerful giver. Why is our cheerfulness giving less and less and less to the Lord? This company will say that every, if every Christian tithed, um, that our church organizations would have an extra $139 billion per year for kingdom causes. It says that the average churchgoer gives $17 per week. And again, I'm not arguing. I'm not arguing. I don't know what I'm arguing. Jesus teaches so much on this, and it's never, okay, let's pass the plate. What he seems to go after is the heart here. And what seems to happen is that if we're, if we're to be rich, what this text seems to preach is that if we are to be rich towards God, then we've got to be generous with our resources. Okay? Let's move on. Okay, that's the hard part. Okay, you can... You can Stop sweating, okay, because I'm not, I'm not about, I'm not, yeah, you can stop sweating, okay. Maybe, maybe, two, point number two, maybe it's just as difficult, I don't know. Number two, we are to be generous with our time. We're to be generous with our time, not just with our resources, but also with our time. Look at verse 19 with me. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you've prepared, whose will they be? You see, this man thought that he had got to the point of his life where he could just, he could retire, he could take it easy, he could coast, he could just be merry, he could just enjoy the stuff that he had accumulated. He thought, he thought that the calling in life was to hit a certain age and then be done. And just, and, just, and just coast um, from there, just take it easy from there. But from this text, in part, we realize that we're never called to relax. We're called to be generous with our time as well as our resources. And we're right back to the I exist for you. You exist for me. We exist for each other mentality. That's what we see here in this text and how we, are, how we should be using our, our time. We are, we are called to invest in each other with our time. That means that there are going to be times that, that I stay up late at night and don't sleep as much because I'm praying for you. And, and hopefully you'll do the same for me. That there are times that, we come, that, we, that things happen in life where I'm about to sit down for dinner with my family and then I'll get a call, some emergency that I've got to respond to um, and I'll have to give up my time. Hopefully you'll do that for me and for, for each other as well. That we are called, we are called not just, not just to invest our resources, but to be wise in how we use our time, to be generous with our time. That means that, it, that generosity doesn't, doesn't just um, affect the dollar or our resources, but in the way, the time that we use those resources. Um, in other words, our, our homes, our homes, we should use the time to invite others in to share a meal with us and, and talk about deep things of God and, and, and laugh and celebrate together and cry with each other whenever things are, are not going well. That, that that takes time and that takes effort, right? You ever got that call or that text? And you're like, ooh, I don't know if I want to get this right now because I don't know if I've got 30 minutes. I want to give up for this conversation. According to the text, we need to be generous, not just with our dollar, but with our time. And we read, read mentioned a couple of weeks ago about, about Edmonds, kind of, the, kind of the place where you get off work, you drive in, shut the garage, and no one sees you till the next day. We're called to be wise with our time to use our time to invest into the kingdom. We're called to use our cars to invest in the kingdom with. And, and, and what that means is um, that I take a little bit of time to maybe go pick someone up and bring them to worship. The idea here is that we're generous with our time. I read this week, Don't Waste Your Life by John Piper, um, it's, it's a really good book. I'm having, I'm having Kenny and Tyson read uh, 
desiring God. That's like really, really big. If you want the smaller, I didn't tell him about this, so, but if you, got the, if you want the smaller version of that, you can read Don't Waste Your Life. I read it, I read it in a week. John Piper tells a story from, from 2000 um, of two, two senior adult women. Um, one, was named, one was named Ruby. She had been single her entire life. She was, she was in her 80s, and she decided to use the remaining years that she had overseas as a missionary in an underdeveloped country. And her friend, Laura, who was a widow and was a retired doctor, she was approaching 80, and she decided to do the same thing. And so here these two 80-ish-year-old women are on the mission field using their own resources, using the rest of their lives to, 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 to share the gospel and to live out the gospel in this, in this culture that was, that was needing the gospel brought to them. And they're driving their Jeep, um, on the mountain, and the brakes go out, and they just they drive right off the right off that mountain to their death. Okay, and so Piper Piper says, um, you know, people were describing that as a tragedy, like talking about all the time. What a tragedy! What a tragedy that these ladies gave their life to the Lord, and that's how it ends. What a tragedy! Piper said he looked up the Reader's Digest for a story about the same time, and it spoke of a couple from the Northeast who had, were enjoying an early retirement. He was 59, she was 51. They were enjoying an early retirement um, down in Florida, cruising on their 30-foot yacht, playing softball, picking up shells on the beach. He said that, that's what the tragedy is. That's the tragedy. The tragedy that we waste the last 30 years of our lives, 20 years of our lives, 40 years of our lives, however, however long it is that we waste, that we waste the, the years of our lives when we could be being generous to advance the gospel. The question was, what are, what's that couple going to do if they, if they stand before the Lord and they, and, and they are believers? What are, what are they going to do? Hold up their shells to the Lord? and say, this is what I did with the time you gave me? See, the idea here in this text is that all of life, that, that all of life be for all of Christ, that we order our lives around Jesus all the time, not just fitting him in on Sunday morning or Wednesday night or five-minute devotionals to start our day. This man thought he was going to have all these years, all these years in verse 19 to relax, to eat, to drink, to be merry. And what he didn't know was that very night, that very night, his soul was going to, going to be required of him. You see, he didn't have the time that he thought. My question for you and for myself is, do we have the time that we think? You on your way home, are one person checking their phone, driving, and going over that line from your life being, your soul being required. You are one doctor call away from, you've got a month at best. One, 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 of the, one, one call. You may think you have years. You may get, be getting to the to the, in the fourth quarter of life, and, and you might say, well, I'm in overtime of life with, with my age. Whether you have a day left, a year, or 50, are you going to waste it? Or are you going to use your time generously so that others can come up and know Christ and walk in Him and live for Him? See, the idea here in this text, generosity, is that we're generous with our resources. Two, that we're generous with our time. And then number three here in this text, we are generous because God is generous to us. We're generous to others because God is generous to us. Verse 21 says, So, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. I don't know if there's certain passages that you historically wrestle with. This is one for me. Okay? I read, I read this every year, whether I'm just reading through the New Testament in a year like we're doing, or I'm reading the Bible. 
Bible in a year. Every time I come to this, there's, there's a little bit of internal wrestling because I'm trying to figure out what it means to live life rich towards God. Again, I wish Jesus would say, well, if you want to be rich towards God, you do this, and you do this, and you do this. That'd be really great, right? Like, we're, we're left here. We're left here trying to figure this out. We're, trying, we're left here wrestling with what it means to be rich towards God. You know what helps me? You know what helps me be rich towards God? Looking at God's Word at how He was rich towards us. It helps me live rich towards God whenever I look in Scripture how He's rich towards us. You know what John 3.16 says? For God, the Father, get this, dads, God the Father, He so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. And you can, you can take a lot of things from me. You are not getting my son. You're not getting my daughters. That they are off limits to you. you. I don't care what you need. You're not getting them. God was so generous to us that while we were sinners... You know, it's not that he came, oh, these, these, these are really admirable people. These are really good people i got to send my son for. We were at our worst, sinful, broken, the cause of Jesus dying on the cross. And God, as he looks at the sinfulness and the fallenness and the brokenness of the world, and as he, in his infinite wisdom, thinks through his own plan. How, can I, how do I make this brokenness right? I'll give my son. And it's costly. And it'll be painful for him. And he will suffer. And the worst part wasn't even the crucifixion. The worst part was that yours and my sins were placed on him. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. He died for any who would come to know him. When we were hostile towards him, he came, he gave. When we said, I'll never do that again, and only did that again, he still came. When we didn't even care, when we knew it was sin and didn't even care, God gave. Listen, listen to Philippians 2. Philippians 2, verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. You know what that means? That means that he was in heaven. He's the eternal son of God. Jesus didn't come onto the scene when he was born in a manger in Bethlehem. He's the eternal son of God who was with God in heaven that stepped away from that, that stepped away from the continuous praise of angels with everything that they were in it to come to, a, to, to an earth where we maybe at our best are distracted during worship. And he gave up the riches of heaven, and he gave up the praise of heaven, and he, and he took on the likeness of men. He emptied himself. Verse 8, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Why, why are we called to be generous? How, how, do we, how do we understand what generosity is? We look to Jesus. We look to God. And we, we can be generous because God is generous. When I was called to ministry, um, 14 years old, I was sitting um, at Falls Creek in the worship service, and in, in a voice that wasn't audible, um, 
that was much louder than that, I sensed in my spirit God saying, Heath, I have given everything for you. I want you to give your life to following me in ministry. And it's not somehow I need to work and add to the cross or work for myself. It had nothing to do with that. It had everything to do as I was generous towards you. I want you to be generous towards me. We can do that because God's generous towards us. There's a family in our, in our church. They, they recently told me um, that they are increasing their giving to the Lord a half a percent every year. Okay, so they started at 10%, and I have no clue. I don't know if they're at 12% or 20% or 50%. I have no clue what they're at right now, but their family goal is to increase their giving a half a percent every year. How? How? They can do that because God is generous towards them. There's a family in our church that blesses um, people in our church anonymously and, and, and would say something like, hey, I want to do this. I want to send kids to camp or I want to do, do whatever. And I don't want you to tell anyone who did this. How? They understand a God who's been generous to them. Acts chapter 2, there was a group of Christians who had needs, and so you know what happened? The Christians began to sell their possessions and then distribute the needs to those who, who, who had the need so that there was no more need. How did they do that? Because, because the apostles weren't saying, you know what, Bobby over there, he's, he's really having a hard time. Let's, what, hey, hey, Paul, why don't, you go sell your, why don't you go sell your land and give it? There, there was no commands going on there. It was God just moving in the hearts of his people to take care of his people. Why? How? They understood God's generosity. Zacchaeus, who's a sinner, um, the chief, one of the chief of sinners um, in, this, in this culture, the worst of the worst, Zacchaeus encounters the generosity of Christ. And Jesus doesn't say, Hey, Zacchaeus, you know how you've been ripping off people? Probably shouldn't do that anymore. Doesn't say anything like that. Doesn't, doesn't call him out on any of those things. You know what Zac Zacchaeus does after encountering the generosity of Christ? Zacchaeus says, half of my, half of my wealth I'm going to give to the poor. And if I've def de defrauded, if I've, if, I've, um, if I've defrauded anyone and he had, that was sort of his job, he said, I'll pay back four times that amount to anybody I've taken from. How, how, how? What would possess a person to do that? He understood the generosity of God. I wonder what God's leading you to do today. Um, I, hope, I hope you don't hear like a guilt sermon because that might, get us a good, that might get us a good offering this week, but not next. We're not, I'm not, we're not talking about passing the plates here we're talking about what's God leading you to do to be generous with your resources with your time and and would you even would you even try to peer into his generosity when you do he's going to lead you to do something something what's he leading you to do you may be here today and just hearing about a generous God who gave his life for you maybe he's calling you and maybe you're like hey for the first time I want in on that I I I want to follow Christ. Listen, in a second, we're going to give you a chance to respond. Um, I'd love to visit with you if you want to talk about how to commit your life to Christ. I'd love to talk with you if, if you want to pray about anything you've heard. Maybe you've got a different prayer need. Maybe you as families just want to come to the altar and say, how can, how can we be more generous with our resources, with our time? Maybe just ask the Lord that. And then buckle up. And then buckle up. But it'll be a good thing, I promise. Let's pray.